All right, I'm going to do the experiment of letting the slides time themselves. So I'm going to talk about each of them for as long as they're up there. My name is Noah wardrop Fruin. I'm the Associate Director of the Software Studies Group here at UCSD. And um, I'm going to let the slides time themselves. OK, so there are not many things. I don't want to offer a definition of software studies, right? But I think we can say maybe that software studies require software specifics. I think that's something we've seen through everything here. So for example, we might say we don't think of Walmart as software. We don't even think of it as a software company. But we could definitely look at it through the lens of the specifics of its logistic software. I'm through with that. Uh, I've just finished, or I'm almost finished, with uh, writing a book that I'm about to hand to Doug over there um, called Expressive Processing which is trying to do software studies for digital media. Obviously, I'm not the only person here interested in that. Um, of course, every piece of digital media involves software, um, but if, as people have just, oh, I'm through with that. Okay, so computational processes as um, authorial expression is one of the ways that I mean the term expressive processing, right? So here's some code from the initial sketch for The Sims. And there are a couple of people I'd like to connect to here, right? So um, Ian talks about software being a way of representing systems in systems. OK, only one person I'm going to connect to. Also, computational processes are designed artifacts. That's another way I mean the term expressive processing. If you pried open the back of a watch from the 1970s, you might see a you know, specifically Swiss mechanism. You might see a specifically Japanese quartz, right? And it's connected to economies, and I'm through talking about that. OK, I'm going to give you one example, actually two quick examples. One is the first story generation system that we normally talk about, James Meehan's Tailspin. And a story generation system is different from a choose-your-own-adventure book, because if you rip out a page of a choose-your-own-adventure book, everything else is still the same. Whereas if you change one rule in a story generation system, all the stories might change. OK, so people in Tailspin have problems. In this case, Tom the Bear is hungry. That's his problem. And he's proposing a deal to Wilma that she'll tell him where some berries are so he can stop being hungry. She speculates. What does that mean? She creates an imagined Tom. She uses tailspin simulation to create possible Toms. What might Tom do if he believed in berries? And she's selfish. She's looking for benefit. Is there one of these possible worlds going to do something good for me? She decides that she's going to lie to Tom, right? From a fictional perspective, right, thinking about this as a story, this is psychological action. That's what's going on here in this sort of moment in tailspin. Now, um, while Tailspin has characters and those characters try to solve problems, um, none of that is apparent to the audience. It's just those two sentences, one after another, as meaningful to the audience as though a coin was flipped. So that's part of what I mean by expressive processing, right? Is that if you've got something that you're capturing in a computational system, and much like Michael was talking about, it needs to get out there to where the audience can see it for it actually to function as expressive processing. And in fact, expressive processing owes a debt to Michael's expressive AI terminology and to Chris Crawford's, um, OK, I'm through talking about that. Um, so now, I think also expressive processing, besides offering something to authors, offers something to critics. So for example, Janet Murray in Hamlet and the Holodeck, her critique of Tailspin is that the plot structure is too abstract, and we need tools for letting authors define plot structures in better ways. Of course, there is no plot structure. It's entirely based on characters. Oh, and OK, I'm through talking about that. Espen Orset, in his book, Cybertext, makes a similar kind of move, where he talks about how there's a problem with Tailspin that it simulates an author. Of course, the critique of Tailspin in the AI community is that there is no authorial simulation. And in both cases, these authors actually have things about, so um, OK, I'm through talking about that. Um, a software studies approach to Tailspin, on the other hand, might do both the thing that I did with the author, but also the thing I talked about in terms of prying off the back of the watch. When you look at the way that Tailspin operates on the inside, you connect to whole histories of artificial intelligence, of cognitive science. OK. so. I think that expressive processing and software studies for digital media can help us with authoring and interpreting. I've talked about those. I also think it can help us with understanding. Some of that procedural literacy that people were talking about in earlier presentations, this is an image of Logo, right? One of the standard procedural literacy projects. But I don't think just learning to write code is the only way to procedural literacy. 
I think also there can be telling examples that help us toward procedural literacy. Part of the reason procedural literacy is important is it helps us be better citizens. So for example, in the US, we've been asked to make decisions about systems that cr get critiqued by people like the ACM, right? The ACM writes a letter saying, hey, that kind of system is gonna have a lot of false positives and a lot of false negatives. The average person in the US reading that is gonna say, what, right? The restaurant game, I think, is actually an interesting way in to thinking about this. I think games and digital media are a place to get telling examples. So this is an attempt to do a classic scruffy AI thing, having a restaurant script. But rather than writing it by hand the way you might with something like Tailspin, instead what you're doing is you're getting it by doing examinations of a large number of actions taken by lots of different people, trying to statistically analyze them down into plan networks. And then what Orkin does in terms of, at this point, his research, trying to say whether these are good plan networks, is that he looks at them and says, how do they compare to um, actions that other people have taken and how humans relate to those as being either um, typical or atypical. So for example, um, a false positive in his system is while it does correctly identify that a man who is trying to take the waitress home with him and not pay for dinner is doing something odd, it also recognizes that anyone saying something atypical is doing something odd. And you can, in fact, order endless pie and beer until you fill the restaurant. And it does not recognize that as something odd. That's a false negative, right? And I think those are a lot easier to understand than the ACM's letter to the Total Information Awareness Office. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much.